Join us for an interview with Ian O'Meara and Darren Mornstein, co-founders of Hanley's Nashville Hot Chicken, a brand that was created in the truest sense of necessity being the mother of invention. When COVID closed their physical restaurant locations, they decided to capitalize by creating a brand that would benefit themselves and other kitchen operators. If you're interested in food and innovation, this interview will be just your taste. We looked to the States and we, we looked to see what kind of uh, third party delivery was operating down there and what, uh, what concepts were successful. And we saw that uh, spicy fried chicken was, uh, was, was, really, uh, was really on the mark. And so we spent four months developing uh, the concept um, and then we launched it in August of 2020. And it took off like crazy right away. So let's get into this. We all know that necessity is the mother of all invention. And for a lot of business owners, the pandemic proved to be a time where being creative in your approach was essential if you wanted to keep your business open. While many industries were impacted by COVID-19, the restaurant industry was doubly suffering. A decline in revenue of 40% or more in 2020 was a reality for almost half of all food and drinking establishments. In the United States alone, more than 110,000 locations closed for business temporarily or permanently, putting nearly two and a half million people on the street. To sustain themselves, many restaurants began using third-party food delivery apps. This switch would provide a lifeline for the restaurant industry as the world was beginning to change how it ate. But despite how painful the process, it did present an amazing opportunity for change. Nowadays, food delivery has become a global market worth more than $150 billion, having more than tripled in the last four years. And the global food delivery industry is expected to grow to $320 billion by 2029. Our two guests, Ian and Darren, decided not to give in when the going got tough. They sought ways to generate money during the hardest time for the service industry by creating a brand that they and other businesses with underutilized kitchen capacity could capitalize on. And they did so by looking to the southern US for ideas and inspiration. The growing trend of Nashville hot chicken in the Deep South was impossible to ignore. Wanting to introduce a bit of Southern flavor to the North, the plan for Hanley's was hatched. The guys created a menu, a business model, and an opportunity for other restaurants to create on-trend food that would help increase their sales. Now, Hanley's, even well after locations have reopened, continues to deliver results. In this interview, Ian will describe the stark reality he faced when the pandemic forced him to close his locations, how the idea of starting a ghost kitchen and delivering Nashville hot chicken came about, and how combining business and friendship can become a strength and much more. Now, let's meet Ian and Darren. So I am super excited to introduce two fantastic entrepreneurs, co-founders of a company called Hanley's Nashville Hot Chicken. So I'd like to welcome Ian O'Meara and Darren Mornstein, uh, and gents, I have to say, the two of you personify Canadians beautifully. If you look up Canadians in a dictionary, I'm sure we'd see your pictures. Love the checked uh, flannel shirt. So uh, welcome, gents, thanks for joining us. Thanks, yeah, thank Robert. you much, Robert. And the best thing is we didn't even coordinate. I just knew when I, when I got dressed this morning for this, I was like, oh, Ian's for sure wearing plaid and it's gonna be like a red tone. So I'm, I'm gonna go blue. <laughs> I'm, glad you, I'm glad you actually cleared that up because I didn't know in, in Canada whether that was there was actually just your skin or whether that was a shirt. So it's good to know it is actually yes. clothing. So thanks for that. Yeah, so my pleasure. So guys, you you kind of had me at hot chicken. So uh, I'm so glad that we're talking today. But what we want to get into is actually the origin story of the business itself. So. I know that this was that the the birth of of Hanley's was really uh, you know the classic case of um, ne of necessity is the mother of all invention. So can you maybe start by talking a little bit about you know what Hanley's does and where it came from? Sure, it was uh, it was it was born out of desperation and necessity, basically. Um, I run a bunch of restaurants in downtown Ottawa and the pandemic hit and uh, obviously the restaurants, uh, they, they tanked pretty fast. And so we had to figure out uh, a way, how could we, how could we generate some revenue uh, from another source and not just uh, from the office workers, which, uh, which are no longer there. Um, and so 
we looked to the states and we we looked to see what kind of uh, third party delivery was operating down there and what uh, what concepts were successful and we saw that uh, spicy fried chicken was uh, was was really uh, was really on the mark and so we spent four months developing uh, the concept um, and then we launched it in August of two thousand and twenty and it took off like crazy right away. But the interesting thing that, about your model is is the fact that you had had, I guess, Ian, you'd been running multiple uh, retail locations that were serving this kind of central core of workers. And of course, that business dried up. But the interesting thing about Hanley's is the fact that it is a model that's kind of capitalizing on a trend, which is ghost kitchens. The idea of, you know, the, it really is a the collision of circumstance where you've got consumers are ordering more. Ghost Kitchens were looking for brands to represent, and thus Hanley's came about. So, how does the business actually actually work? Um, uh, essentially, we so it's, it's third party delivery, um, and what we did was uh, once we once we found that it was successful at our location, I started thinking about all the other restaurant operators that were uh, were in the basically the same predicament predicament as. Uh, as we were, which was, uh, was how do we generate revenue with no indoor dining and, uh, and basically no customers coming to our door. Um, and so we, we thought, okay, well, why don't we, uh, why don't we start working with, uh, with other restaurants? There's other parts of the city where, uh, where we can't service because the third party only goes about three to five kilometers away from your restaurant. And so we thought, okay, let's, uh, Let's start talking to some other restaurants and some other people that we know. Um, and so we approached uh, a restaurant out in Canada, um, and we basically met with them. and uh, And he was like, uh, "He's like, all right, what's you know, what, what's what's the catch here?" He's like, "How much does it cost?" And we we're like, "Doesn't cost anything to start up." Uh, and he's like, uh, "He's he's like, that's it. You just come and train us and start us up." And I was like, "Yeah, that's that's all." And so we just uh, we went in there and. Uh, and show them how to cook it, and they started cooking it, and uh, and there you go, Bob's your uncle, and it was uh, away you go. The uh, the beauty of the of the model, Robert, is that uh, you know when we talk about risk, right? So people are a little bit could be a little bit risk averse, regardless of the situations that they're in, uh, you know, and specifically with the restaurants, if you will, during the you know the lockdowns and the pandemic and the regulations. Uh, this model what was unique about it was that we were bringing a proposition to you know, other colleagues in the industry where there was an opportunity to create revenue without any real additional costs. You know, it was like bringing in a, a new brand that, that didn't have to necessarily mix with their, their current restaurant or their current model. Uh, it was just using the resources that were already there built in and, and using their fixed costs from their, their current restaurant to really just incorporate the Hanley's brand on, you know, in the digital third-party platforms. Uh, you know, and like Ian said, it's, it's a matter of training them, you know, took a day of, of training and then, uh, you know, just getting it up and running on those platforms. But that, you know, it's, it's funny because if you don't know the restaurant industry, you may not, you may miss how kind of transformational that this business model is. And just to kind of lay it out for somebody who might be watching this is that if you're a restaurateur, you're committed to a lease, and that lease involves a significant amount of space. And if your customers go away because of COVID, you're still sitting on that lease. And so then the issue becomes, well, how do we actually use utilize this space so that you know we're not hemorrhaging, you know, we're not hemorrhaging cash? So you guys have come along and you're no longer a restaurant anymore. You're almost like a brand creator, right? In fact, not just a brand creator, but a, a, a marketing, um, a marketing business to a certain extent. So um, is that, you know, what have you guys learned along the way in terms of, uh, of that shift of your fo in your focus? Like, what is it, what have you picked up in terms of the potential for this model for restaurants going forward? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, the, the, you know, clearly we've learned a ton, right? Like I think, uh, like most entrepreneurs and most startups and most businesses, if, if you're not learning anything within the first six, 12 months, weeks, even for that matter, then, you know, you're not really doing anything and you're remaining complacent. So, you know, we, we learned pretty quickly that, you know, we thought we were getting into the restaurant business. Uh, and like you said, Robert, it's, uh, you know, pretty intuitive. It's like, no, we're, we're actually a, a marketing business. And, 
you know, bringing this opportunity to some of these restaurants, you know, we started to, you know, I guess what we learned was to kind of rely on those business partners in those restaurants, right? Like, so for example, you know, we're, we're based and started up in Ottawa, but when we're moving into, you know, Kingston and Brockville and Cornwall, Montreal, Whitby, Toronto, wherever it is, you know, a lot of it is we, we like to rely or need to rely on these restaurant partners of ours because they know their areas, right? They know their, their customers and their clientele, right? So, you know, we, we, you know, we couldn't be disillusioned by the fact that we're like, oh yeah, it's going to work everywhere. And, you know, this third party platform is going to work in every single city or, you know, this, this menu concept is going to work every, everywhere else. You know, what we learned was, you know, we, we need to work with the restaurant operators to ensure that we get a good understanding of the customers that are in their specific regions and kind of cater the marketing and the messaging uh, to those specific populations. So, I mean, there's obvious credibility in the fact that, you know, Ian, you had been running a bunch of, a bunch of uh, restaurants already. But wh- where was the, I know, again, we talked at the beginning about this being, you know, necessity being the, the source of the invention here. But how did you make the leap? Like, what made you say, you know what, this can be something that's not just for us. This can be something for others. Like, what made you think you know, we're going to go in a completely different direction with this and not just limit it to your own, to your own physical locations. Well, there's probably two parts to that. Part of it was we needed to get a little bit of extra revenue somewhere. So we thought we could work with other, uh, other people to, to kind of, it's a kind of a, a selfish approach to it, but to, to make a bit of money. Um, and then also I just like, we just knew the hurt of the other restaurants. We knew how everybody was struggling. Nobody knew what to do. Everybody was, this was all brand new. Everybody was scrambling. Um, and, uh, everybody I talked to in the industry, everyone was just, they were, they, they just didn't know what to do. Um, and so we had this thing that was working for us. And so we thought, okay, well, let's, uh, let's share it with, uh, with some of our colleagues and, uh, and let them try it. And, and it, and it turned out to just be a win, win, win situation um we worked with uh with a major distributor to get introductions to uh to some of the restaurants and uh and it was just um it was just restaurants working with restaurants at the end Mm. of the day um and there was a real that was one of the most gratifying things about all of it for me is the camaraderie of you walk in and you're not really you're not really a salesman you're you're you like they are they are me and i am them you know we walk i I walk in and uh and we talk about our struggles and we you know we confide in each other how difficult it's it's been and uh and that that camaraderie is uh that's actually probably been the most gratifying thing of uh of the whole experience uh for me um i really uh i really enjoy going into the restaurants and and talking to uh to the other operators and uh just bouncing ideas off of each other as well, you know, for, for other parts of our business. And you'd be surprised, like a lot of restaurant operators don't know the restaurant operator on the next street over or the next building down. Um, Everyone's got their head down. They're working. They're like, go, 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 go. They're trying to figure out how do we (laughs) fill this shift tonight? Because somebody, you know, called in sick five minutes before the shift started or, you know, uh, how do, how do we fix this leaky tap without calling, uh, you know, without calling the plumber, uh, because, you know, uh, he's, he's got to, it's a, it's thin margins. You gotta, gotta solve a lot of problems yourself. So, uh, just speaking with, uh, with the other operators and knowing other people are going through what you're going through. Um, it's been, uh, that's been really gratifying for them and, and for, for us as well. So we've obviously spent, you know, uh, reasonable amount of time talking about your background in the restaurant industry, Ian, but I was curious about how you guys came together. Like, what's the nature of the partnership? How does it work? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, the nature of the partnership, to be honest with you, is uh, is rooted in friendship. You know, Ian and I met, uh, I like saying this, the, the turn of the millennium. You know, it was, it was 1999. We'd finished university. Uh, you know, Ian in Ottawa, myself in Montreal, and uh, I ended up going to New Zealand. And oddly enough, you know, the the guy from Brockville and the guy from Montreal ended up meeting each other in New Zealand, forming a, a pretty strong friendship. Uh, you know, like we spent a few years there and, and what have you. I ended up coming back to Canada. Ian stayed in New Zealand 
uh, you know, starting his career as a, as a restaurant operator. Um, eventually, Ian did come back to Canada. And as things work out with good friends, uh, we figured out a way to uh, convince our wives that uh, we should live in the same neighborhood down the street from each other and kind of raise our families together, if you will. Nice. Um, all that to say, you know, for, you know, it took us 20 years to figure out a way to work together. You know, uh, we were both in different industries doing different things. And, uh, you know, it, it took something quite like the, the pandemic and, you know, a shakeup in the industry for, for Ian and I to kind of come together and be like, hey, what about this? Why don't we, uh, would this concept work? You know, uh, Ian's background and skills and strengths in, in restaurants. Uh, I had just spent 10 years in, uh, you know, a digital marketing industry or digital content creation industry. Uh, you know, so we figured out a way to kind of, you know, combine those two, I guess, experiences and, and knowledge, if you will, with the trends that were happening in the United States to kind of come up with the, the Hamleys Nashville concept. So what, so is your role mainly the marketing side of things? Yeah, I would, I would say mainly on the marketing side, like I'm definitely not the one to go into, you know, our, our, you know, restaurant partners and talking to them about how they've set up their line. Right. Or I'm not the one that's going to talk about the, you know, certain qualities of food and, and what have you. Um, you know, my side of things, if you will, is, you know, kind of the social media component, the advertising piece, some of the marketing strategies and ideas, uh, a bit more of the branding side of things, if you will. So that's what's really interesting about your business model is the fact that, um, you know, first of all, it is a bit of, a bit of, a bit of inspiration. It's a bit of good news for a sector that's been amazingly hard hit. But it really does rely on somebody that has got the credibility of knowing how a restaurant works, how margins work, how the business operates and makes money. And it, but it is purely brand driven. There's no physical location. It's only about whether a consumer understands you exist and their belief in the product itself. So, uh, I mean, it must be, it, it's great to have those two sides of the coin represented in your partnership. I'm wondering though, your when you walk this idea into a restaurateur, leaving aside their own desperation for a moment, how hard is it to get that, to get the strategy across to, to a restaurateur and get them to say, of course, this is something I should take advantage of? Uh, it's, to be, it's really not that hard, Robert. Uh, you know, when the, it's one of those things, it's like, it's just a concept and the model just makes sense, right? So, you know, when we are talking to a restaurant operator about the idea and the concept, you know, bigger picture. And then when we start to get into what the margins look like and, you know, the potential revenues that can happen from this, ultimately the strain on their current operation is, is quite minimal, right? So it becomes very enticing for those restaurant operators to at least give it a try. And again, you know, we're not signing long-term contracts. We're not, a, a, you know, putting together franchise models with these restaurant operators. You know, what we're doing is we're creating a partnership and if, and if it works, Great, we'll continue that partnership for you know as as long as both of us want. Um, you know, when we talk about the the acceptance of it, it really is. And, and Ian can speak more to this, but you know, Ian shared this with me, and we talked about it quite often. So the the idea is for a current restaurant operator, it's like adding four or five menu items to their current menu, right? So it's like, hey, look, this is this is your restaurant. This this is what you sell. By incorporating that, you know, Hanley's Nashville Hot Chicken into that operation, especially on the third-party platform, it's the equivalent of saying, you know, let's try out this new chicken sandwich on our menu, or let's add some waffles onto our menu. You know, and and in regards to the strain on their current operations, it's extremely minimal. Hmm. And the great thing is they don't have to like we take all the we do all the brand creation, all the marketing, all the advertising. They do what they're good at, which is fulfilling orders for food um so it's uh like that that was one of the challenges at the beginning for a lot of restaurants when the pandemic hit was oh my god we have to create a gross brand we have to figure out how to market it we have to you know and, right. and that to take that off of people's plates right um and you you go in and you say all you have to do is cook the chicken when the orders come in you cook the chicken um and and it's yeah it's that's what they're good at that's what they do they're Restaurant operators can fulfill orders left, right, and center all day long, you know? So I think Ian, that's... Uh, sorry, Robert, Ian brings up a good point, you know, and it kind of goes to the, the question that you asked was, you know, when the pandemic hit and the ghost kitchen concept 
was being floated around. You know, a lot of people didn't know about it. Restaurant operators who were, you know, savvy enough were trying to create that and jump on that. Um, but what we noticed with a lot of those new ghost kitchens that were coming out was a lot of those restaurants were just taking their current menu and, and dropping it on the platform being like, right. here's my entire menu. This is my restaurant. Let me just get on, you know, Uber eats or skip the dishes and, and throw it up there. And, you know, we started to see that it wasn't that successful. Right. And, you know, we believe that when the consumer is going onto those apps, uh, you know, it's not like sifting through Netflix, right. Where you're just looking through a bunch of different, you know, movie or TV titles until something catches your eye, or it's you're going back to your tried and true, you know, television show or movie that, that you have on the platform with this, we realize like there needs to be a brand creation. There needs to be something that is, you know, specific and, you know, the food needs to travel well, right? So throwing up 18 items onto, a, onto, you know, an Uber Eats menu, um, we saw wasn't driving much success, you know, keep it short, keep it concise and put, you know, really good food together in those small menus in a specific genre. That's what I, I love about it. It's like, you know, it's, it's been interesting to me when I've been involved in product development in the food space is that once, once a manufacturer, restaurateur in this case, commits to something, it's very hard for them to move off because they've already committed. They've got a certain type of equipment, certain types of kind of pans. You know, and in the case of a restaurant, they've got a physical location. So they don't necessarily even have to rely on having that, that marketing work that hard for them. So then... Coming along, I mean, again, you what you've been able to do is really streamline a process that that says, you know, as you said, exactly, we're going to, you just do what you do well, make stuff, and we're going to make sure that everything else works. So, I mean, I just think it's a it's a fantastic model, and, and congratulations to you guys for being smart enough to come across it and then develop it. But I'm wondering, as we're, as we're now coming out of COVID and as restaurants are getting back to being open again, what does that potentially mean? Like our consumers going to are, are you know certainly consumers will likely reduce their reliance on on online ordering, but what do you think it looks like for a business like yours uh, going forward? Well, I think we got a taste of that like over the summer months. Um, definitely, uh, the sales were not what they were in the in the height of the pandemic, um, but we also got a taste of of the restaurant operators. They 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 they've all stayed with the concept. Um, it's integrated into their into their systems now at this point, um, and they're just. It just goes back to the beginning of it. It's just they're generating extra revenue with what they already have. Um, so it's not. Uh, I, I think it, it seems from our experience that uh, that everyone's uh, going to continue with it. Um, definitely, there's a lot more people. A lot more people have been exposed to third party uh, delivery now from uh, the consumer perspective. There's a lot of people that had never used. Uber Eats before, like uh, my father-in-law, he's, he's in his 70s. He he signed up for Uber Eats. He's using it all the time now. So I think there's uh, um, the customer base on Uber Eats has expanded significantly uh, versus 2019. Hmm. Interesting. And I would imagine that, of course, um, what you've you've now done is is solidly proven a concept, and that concept is the ability to innovate in a way that the typical restaurateur can't and to market in a way that they're not used to. So I'm wondering, what does the future look like in terms of this model for you guys? Do you see moving into other product categories, you know, using the same template? Yeah, definitely. We're, uh, we're actually testing a few other concepts uh, out, of, uh, out of my restaurants right now. Uh, um, and yeah, we're looking at uh, just trying to find products that, that travel easily and don't have a lot of prep time. So they don't put a lot of stress on, on the restaurants um, and don't take up much, much of a footprint within, uh, within their locations. Um, so definitely we're looking at, at new concepts and uh, yeah, it's exciting. It's fun. Do you think that this could become something that takes over for your core business, Ian? For me, no, I, I don't. I don't believe it would ever uh, take over for the core business, but it does. I, I do. I do think going forward, uh, for restaurants to be successful, um, it's it's very helpful to have a couple of uh, concepts going out the back door, if you will, um, hmm. just generating that 
that little bit of extra revenue. Um, and that's, because uh, I mean, just to get to the break even at restaurants takes 29 out of 30 days, you know? So mm-hmm. if, uh, if, you, if you can get that extra $500 a day in sales or $1,000 a day in sales, it really adds up at, uh, really at, the, end of, uh, at the end of the month, uh, for sure. So I, I, I foresee my restaurants always having third-party uh, concepts attached to the, uh, to the core business. Hmm. And so 20 years after the fact, you guys wanting to become partners, you're now partners. How's it working out? To put you on the spot. <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> uh, it, it, it goes well again like it's uh you know we're ian's a, a super easy guy to get along with and as i found out uh an even easier guy to to work with you know like when you take friendship and you know a lot of people are like don't mix friendship and business and don't mix family and business you know like i, I don't necessarily agree with that you know it's like uh you know i i try to go by the the tenets of uh you know like you can make it work. It, it, it's, you know, it's, it's not a difficult thing to do. Um, and, and it's been great. It's I enjoyable to, working with people you like, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, but I spoke to a, to somebody who's a consultant uh, with small and medium enterprise. And he said that he had, he had client organizations where the partners would not take holidays because they didn't trust one another. So I think there's that classic story. Don't work with your friends. As you pointed out, Darren, I'm wondering, like, uh, like how how do you make it work? Like, how does it, you know, without wanting to trample on the friendship, of course, you know, how do you how do you avoid ruining the friendship? How do how do you work on it day to day? You keep your uh, you keep your kids friends with each other. You're going to do anything for your kids, right? So my kids <laughs> came one day and were like, "Oh, I'm going over to Ian's house to play with his daughters." I'd be like, "You're not allowed. It's over." You know, that would devastate my kids. So, you know. Uh, that, that's one way to keep it. And then two, to be honest, it's, uh, you know, I wouldn't say either of us have super strong personalities or, or, or domineering personalities, if you will, you know? So, uh, it's really about listening, you know, like I'm going to, uh, I'm going to listen to Ian when he's talking about the restaurant industry and he's, you know, I'm going to lean into his experience and his, and his expertise, you know, and, and I think he does the same on, on my side of the things, you know, and, and we're learning from each other every single day. I know it sounds cliche ish and I don't want to be that guy, but we really are learning from each other almost every single day. It's not cliche if it's, if it's, uh, you know, an experienced truth. So, um, I've had the benefit of talking to you guys now several times and right from the get go, I really, I, I really thought you guys were super smart, uh, you know, great collaborators. And I just love the, the model and what you guys are doing. And I think you are really a, you are what this channel is supposed to personify, which is to uh, to inspire people to get into business or to help people in business find a new sense of purpose. And after 20 years, it's uh, amazing, Ian, that that when faced with the challenge, you didn't just roll over. You've actually created something new and exciting. So I just want to say, guys, I wish you all the best. And I want to say thank you again for, for making time. Thanks, Robert. Thanks for having us, Robert. It's always fun talking to you. You know that. Thanks so much for sticking to the end of our interview with Ian O'Meara and Darren Mornstein, co-founders of Hanley's Nashville Hot Chicken. What I love about this story is the strength of their friendship and how it enabled two business veterans to come together to solve a problem that would become a going concern long after the restaurants reopened. Remember, if you like this interview, please hit like and subscribe to discover more inspiring stories of great entrepreneurs. Thanks, and I hope to see you again soon.